Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Mindful webinar. I'm Brian Welch, CEO at Mindful Communications, and it's my huge honor today to have as a guest Diana Hahn, Chief Medical Officer for Unilever, a company that generates between 50 and 55 billion euros a year in revenue and operates in over 190 different countries. Diana, thanks so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, Brian. And thanks to all of you for joining us also. It's a great thrill and an honor to get to talk to you all and to be with people like Diana. Um, go ahead and put uh, send us questions in the Q&A section anytime during the webinar. We might not have time to answer all of them, but we're interested in having a conversation. Um, Diana, prior to joining Unilever, was Chief Medical Officer at GE Appliance, and she's served in similar roles in several very large blue chip companies. Um, she is, I believe, an OBGYN by training, right, Diana? Wow, internist. Close yeah. enough. Uh, oh, well, an internist? Mm hmm But you've delivered some babies. I have. I have. Not in a while, but I have. Sometimes yeah. at work, although I try not to do that. Sometimes at work, you that's mean as right. chief, chief medical officer, you've delivered a baby? Uh, that's a story for another day, but it has happened. <laughs> well, I, I kind of wish it was a story for today. That sounds like a beauty. Uh, it's like riding a bicycle. A lot of box <laughs> breathing during that episode. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, so for the benefit of all of us, um, what is the chief medical officer in a giant multinational consumer product company actually do? Well, um, that's a great question, uh, Brian. And I think the reason why I'm with Unilever is that um, I can do anything and everything that makes sense uh, with respect to supporting our employees, their families, the communities we serve, um, and also our brands as well, because Unilever itself over the last several years has been leaning in much more in terms of health and well-being products. And so the chance to serve consumers when it comes to health and well-being is uh, is part of the you know all duties as uh, as assigned part of the job description. But in a nutshell, um, I am responsible for uh, the health of our global populations around the world. And as you mentioned, we operate in a lot of different countries. So. Um, and, and we are a true multinational. And you know, to date, about 60% or so of our revenue is outside uh, the US and we operate in a lot of low and middle income countries. So it's been such a joy, especially in the COVID era, to be able to really take on public health in the most good old fashioned sense, um, as well as of course, employee health and, uh, and well-being uh, as well. And so any and all things that touch the health of our population falls within um, the remit of my team. Um, now, Unilever has, uh, is widely recognized as a company that's made a big, made huge investments and a big public commitment to the social impact of what it, of, of its operations. It sounds like that becomes part of your mandate, part of your assignment as well. How does that work? I mean, in what ways does the chief medical officer address the health of the communities in which Unilever operates? Yeah, so our purpose as a company is to make sustainable living commonplace. And so if, if you just listen to that phrase very literally, it is ensuring um, that the products that we bring to market, which includes everything from foods and refreshments to products um, that help people, consumers the world over, uh, you know, clean their homes uh, and provision hygiene for themselves and their families, um, our suite of, of products um, that support health very directly. So vitamins, minerals, uh, supplements, um, and the fact that you're absolutely right, we are very much um, a leader before it became fashionable, even in global sustainability. And, and obviously we all know that that's 
even more important than, than ever before, especially with COP26 going on right now. Um, you know, we've articulated very clearly a public uh, position in terms of what our goals are with respect to the health of the planet, the quality of life for the people on this planet, and to know that we have a responsibility to do uh, good while, and while we're doing well. And so um, uh, then where it touches my team and our work is that, of course, our employees live in communities all over the world and uh, are impacted by what happens uh, locally and hyper locally. And so when we operate uh, in the country, in the community, very much our mission um, extends beyond our four walls, not only to what we provision uh, for uh, health and well being um, in the workplace, but of course, knowing that. Uh, an employee's health and well-being extends very much into what's happening environmentally as well. And so certainly social determinants of health um, are would be a great example of something that we have tackled uh, for a long time now, but uh, have been tackling at much greater speed and depth uh, around the world. And it's uh, very much been the case that COVID-19 and just the COVID era that we will live in for, I think for, for a long time to come yet in that very long tail of COVID, that um, we have to invest in the communities that we serve. And so whether it's in India and, you know, uh, other LMICs and bringing our hygiene products very approximately upstream to educate and engage with parents um, as they are expecting uh, their children, uh, when they're very receptive to conversations about health and hygiene and vaccination and doing our part there, whether it's tying in telehealth services um, as uh, you know, something that we provision for employees who purchase our soap products, for example, our Lifebuoy team has done a tremendous job bolting on telehealth uh, to the products that we sell. Those are just a couple ex of examples to the work that we do with the large uh, global NGOs, whether it's the World Health Organization, UNICEF, the Gates Foundation, many other NGOs around the world, and just truly leaning into the responsibility that a corporation has uh, to the health of its employees, their families, and the communities that we serve. And so our team supports all of those efforts. So could we get super granular about that and just mm -hmm. describe to me what experience I might have as a consumer in India buying a Unilever product? What are these enhanced, what would these enhancements look like to me at ground level? Is there a yeah. number on the sure. back of the package or how, how does that work? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if you were to purchase a Lifebuoy uh, product, you would potentially be able to actually leverage a telehealth service so that it's not just, hey, I can wash my um, hands with this soap I just purchased, but potentially there might be someone sick in the household with COVID, for example. And that's why all of a sudden I'm paying a lot more attention um, to this particular product at this time and making this specific purchase. And of course, if I'm standing there about to make a purchase, there's a lot of soap in the marketplace and a lot of hygiene products in the marketplace, but how would we potentially differentiate ourselves is um, have partnerships that can provision complementary uh, resources that we can put into the hands of our consumer. And similarly, and along the same lines, parents uh, who are expecting children, to the example that I referenced earlier, we could have a conversation about why uh, hygiene is so incredibly important to health, but at a time when we're not just yet one more party talking at the parents, but they are maximally receptive because of course no. our parents best for their children. So how is that connection then actually made? Is there a website on the label of the product? Do we, or do mm -hmm. you, do I get an email from you because I registered because I bought some life boy? How does it work at that level? It's executed in uh, different ways in different countries, Brian. So this is one of the things that's always so interesting about being a true multinational. Um, you know, and uh, it literally depends on the market that you're in, the country in terms of the execution. But certainly, a QR code would be, you know, one example. It could be something on the back of a package that directs you to a particular site or in some parts of the world a particular phone number. And so the granular execution 
literally depends on whatever geography that you may be in. I see, cool. Um, then uh, the other part of your responsibility at Unilever is supporting and enhancing the health of the workforce. Yes. How many how many people work for Unilever? There are about 400 Unilever brands or something like that, right? Oh my goodness, I've lost count. Um, we certainly have our mega brands and then we have brands you know, in different geographies and some of our brands uh, actually are known by different names in different markets. So for example, uh, deodorant would be an example where in the US uh, consumers here would, would know us as uh, you know, degree, but in uh, the UK it might uh, be the same product or same-ish product, but known as Rexona. So we do have lots and lots of brands across lots of segments for consumers, um, but we have about uh, 140, 50,000 employees um, today. And what, how does your re responsibility manifest itself then across that workforce? Yep, and so um, the eyes uh, lead the global health and well-being team. And so as the global part of the title implies, um, I do have uh, cross geography responsibilities. And so uh, my team will then uh, partner. So it's bi-directional always, you know, when you are part of a, a multinational, of course, there is no such thing as a one size fits all strategy, nor is there a one size fits all execution as we were talking about in the consumer context for how we do what we do when it, when it comes to supporting health and well-being. But we spend a lot of time listening, understanding, uh, speaking with our teams, um, reading uh, in terms of trends on the ground, and then um, simply then work through what a global strategy is, what the priorities may be for health and well being, and then to develop uh, key core capabilities, particularly uh, from the digital side as well as the service partnership side. And then um, our teams, so I have teams on the ground in different geographies, those teams would then take that co-created strategy um, and the co-created uh, set of capabilities, but then customize. Um, for what is particularly relevant for the segment of employees on the ground in a particular market. And so whether it's making sure it's culturally uh, sound and will resonate uh, linguistically, of course, it has to be aligned uh, to our populations locally as well. And so uh, it's very collaborative. Um, and that's one thing that is really, to be honest, incredibly rewarding. It, it's not a top-down approach to setting the strategy for health and well-being. It, it is very much collaborative and bi-directional and constant sensing and listening uh, directly to our workforce in terms of whatever their, their needs may be. And it very much varies depending on the geography. Could you give us an example of um, what the health and wellness program is looks like in one of the Unilever companies that you're familiar with? That just to sure. give a sense of of what how it's being implemented for the employees. Yep. So um, the you know part of the strategy that is uniform uh, across the portfolio and across the geographies is whole person health. Um, obviously, that's not, not a new concept. Uh, it's certainly that connection of mind, body, community, purpose, uh, environment. Uh, and so uh, an example of something we've launched in uh, my first year at Unilever is we have a whole person health initiative in Latin America. Uh, that is uh, particularly focused on nutrition. And while all the components of health are represented, so physical health, mental health, which is a, a huge area of focus for us even before the pandemic, but even more so now. But the reason we um, selected uh, nutrition in particular as an area of focus in Brazil and Mexico, our initial sites of launch is because we took a look at the data um, with respect to, uh, in this case, obesity and cardiometabolic disease. And we were really worried uh, at what the data showed as far as population characteristics. So when we looked at public health data, 
um, in both of these countries, Mexico and Brazil, we saw that at a population level, something like 70-ish percent or thereabouts of uh, a given community uh, had, had numbers that um, certainly met criteria for obesity. And then when we looked at our workforce, and this is where our health and well-being teams come into play, we have physicians, nurses, nutritionists, you know, other allied health professionals interacting with our uh, workforce. And of course, we have our divisions and our brands, which are in nutrition as well, and, and really in nutrition, but very focused from a strategic standpoint on, on future foods and more plant-based eating as an example. This is where, again, there's a convergence in terms of what we're trying to do to support our employees and their families and what Unilever is trying to do to support global uh, consumers. And so here, the execution of whole person health included uh, working with um, you know, big NGOs uh, like GAIN for an example uh, and, and focused on making sure that we could uh, benchmark um, against uh, nutrition standards and then from there assess ourselves with respect to uh, our work sites and the quality of nutrition um, that we were providing to our workforce, many of whom were, of course, eating breakfast, lunch, uh, or at least lunch or dinner with us, and to ensure that from a nutritional profile standpoint, that we were uh, adhering to the very best of standards of nutrition for the workforce. And But again, coming back to health obviously cannot just begin and end in the workplace. This is where involving families and ensuring that we are deploying digital technologies to complement face-to-face services. So even if we're not feeding an employee on site at a factory, for example, that we can engage with their partner uh, at home and their kids with respect to teaching um, you know, recipes uh, that incorporate healthy ingredients that are easy and quick to prepare. And this is where we worked with our Unilever Food Solutions chefs to deploy their expertise, but to, in this case, deploy it inward to teach families um, you know, how to prepare healthier foods and to eat at home more. Um, and so uh, this is- So like cooking classes, yeah. cooking, cooking classes on yeah. supplements, things like that? Virtually and virtually as well. And similarly, when it comes to physical activity, being really sensitive to what the populations in this country enjoy. Um, and so dance is actually a big part of the culture. And so as an example, from a programming standpoint, um, there are all sorts of uh, group activities and classes, uh, you know, Latin dancing, that sort of thing that our, our employees really gave us feedback that they love. And when, uh, obviously from a, a distance, I live here in the US, for me to be able to have a virtual line of sight to these classes, to these employees, and to see the joy, um, you know, in terms of moving their bodies and, and, uh, and being able to participate in a way that was really culturally resonant um, is very much what we focus on, is, is ensuring that it's appropriate for a population, interesting for a population that certainly drives engagement and stickiness as well. Have you joined in the Brazilian dancing at the at any? <laughs> I do love to dance, I have to say. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's uh, when my daughters uh, have seen it when they're home, uh, uh, let's just say they have quite a bit of fun with it. <laughs> I'll bet, I'll bet. Yes. What about Maybe. mindfulness? Uh, since that's always one of our favorite subjects here. Um, do you, are there mindfulness programs within Unilever? You're a meditator, yeah. aren't you? I am. Uh, so both individually and at an organization level, uh, mindfulness, emotional well-being has just been something we focused on for years and years and years. Um, well before the pandemic, um, mental health has been very important. I mean, we, we certainly saw uh, what the global public health data showed. We certainly heard from our employees because we, we do a lot of sense checking with our employees. We're in touch with our employees on a monthly basis. Um, so incredibly regular um, insights. And we knew that uh, emotional well-being is incredibly important. And so we've launched a, a number of different initiatives, mindfulness uh, being one of them. We're training uh, you know, our employees and actually putting them through a curriculum um, so that they develop skills. Uh, and then it's gonna become a train the trainer model. We've trained, God, close to 
4,000 uh, mental health champions just in the past year alone, so wow. that our employees are never more than, you know, one touch away from a peer when it comes to support. Obviously, there's global EAP, but there's nothing more impactful than potentially being able to reach out to a colleague who understands your environment and the, the stresses that you're you're under from a professional standpoint, but also from a human standpoint as well. Um, and, and then we've also launched tools for teams, knowing that a lot of um, health and well-being is very interdependent in what's going on with a team. You know, certainly we're interacting with our teams as much as our families uh, Monday through Friday and in some parts of the world, uh, you know, uh, other days of the week as well. And then um, focusing on uh, team energy and psychological safety. So these are all initiatives uh, that we have been hard at work on. Um, and we do not believe in, in, in just running discrete campaigns and it's a campaign of the day or a campaign of the, the year. These are commitments that we've made for some years now. And each year we continue to build and build uh, a stronger foundation and expand um, the breadth of our reach to our workforce and the depth of our support uh, as well. Is it, challenging, so, is it challenging to get employees around the world from so many different cultures engaged in mindfulness activities in particular? Um, I have to say it, it hasn't, felt that way for our teams. Um, we have found a real hunger uh, for this kind of support. And uh, it's actually been, uh, in, in fact, relatively easy to bring these initiatives forward. Our leadership team is incredibly uh, supportive of these initiatives, recognizing the need globally uh, to make sure that we're equipping as many of our employees as possible with the skills, uh, you know, to, to be present, mindful, uh, especially in these incredibly difficult times we, we've all lived through as a global community these last couple of years. And so it hasn't, it hasn't been difficult. We've tended to get traction relatively quickly, but I honestly think that's because we've um, been on this journey now for several years, well before the pandemic. So these are not new concepts uh, to us uh, or to our workforce. And we talk about it all the time. Are there metrics um, for, I mean, Unilever has been involved in mental health activities for its employees for a number of years. Yep. Are there, are there metrics that you follow to look for evidence that those programs are beneficial? Yeah, the metric probably that we can report on the most consistently comes directly through the voices of our workforce. And so I mentioned that we sense and connect with our workforce really, really regularly. So literally every month we are sense checking with the workforce. And a lot of the questions are very focused on health, and well-being, and we assess um, directly uh, from our employees. You know, do you feel that you are able to speak up um, when there is a, a challenge from a mental health, emotional well-being standpoint? Um, the tools for teams and our uh, team energy tools are all focused on psychological safety and scoring um, what a baseline would be for a team at T0 and then obviously at any T1 that a team can choose to reassess and look at itself. We do look at the progression over time and for the bottom 30%, those are teams that get um, extra coaching um, from our uh, well-being team. And so we've seen the metrics uh, improving throughout the pandemic, which we're, we're really happy about because these have been, uh, of course, very challenging times that we've all lived and operated under. For sure. Um, mindful, mindfulness training in particular, how do you deploy that? I, I'm probably hard to generalize across a company the size of yours with its diverse geography, but just as an example of how a company can deploy a mindfulness program for the benefit of its, benefit of its employees. 
Yes, so we um, uh, have partnerships here to, from a training standpoint. Uh, so it is actually live training uh, with uh, an expert. So it, it's very experiential. So it's not just, hey, watch a, a video or, or read a blog, even though we, we have plenty of that as well. There's also content that can be consumed. But um, the, I was referencing earlier our mindfulness champions that we put through. Uh, these are individuals who've gone through a pretty intensive, uh, comprehensive training so that they emerge from that training having been through the experience. Um, and there's sort of lots of exercises, of course, that those individuals um, go through. And then they will then from there train the trainer. And that's been a very common model of ours, Brian, is when we roll these initi uh, initiatives forward to try to tackle them with pretty significant depth and to equip people pretty deeply with the skills that they need. Yeah. And it's, uh, I assume the mindfulness programs are optional for the employees. Is there any sort of mandatory? um element of it all or is it just something that's offered and then people people show up so um that's uh, an answer that has two components so unilever has embedded um within its leadership framework or uh, standards of leadership um and within the standards are of leadership are of course presence and, and mindfulness and so we actually assess our uh, workforce, particularly at the management level, on the standards of leadership. And um, so there's a whole very formal process around that. And so obviously, um, one of the things we, we do need to do is to embed the appropriate curriculum um, that then maps to these particular standards of leadership, which includes, of course, what we call the, the inner game. Um, and uh, so it's in that sense, it's very formally embedded and organically embedded in the process. Now, in terms of a, you know, if someone doesn't uh, join uh, mindfulness uh, course and training and doesn't become a mindfulness champion, are there consequences? No, I mean, that th those kinds of initiatives where we deeply train individuals are voluntary. Um, but the leadership skills that are necessary in order to progress a career very much uh, includes the skill sets that mindfulness addresses and leaders are assessed against that. That's incredibly, and I, I had no idea, and it's incredible. The, so if I'm a plant manager of a manufacturing facility in, in Eastern Europe somewhere, am I aware that, the, that those skills of mindfulness, that the qualities of mindfulness are virtually a performance variable for me? Um, I would say so. I mean, that should be fairly well known because, again, we have the standards of leadership have been articulated very clearly. They're, they're not, you know, brand new by any means. They predate the pandemic um, as well. And so our, certainly even for me, I, I'm a year into my tenure at Unilever. Uh, before I joined during the interview process, I uh, was made aware of our standards of leadership and was very, which very clearly articulates um, the importance of that mind-body connection and attending to the mind and body um, as a prerequisite uh, and an enabler, if you will, of uh, good leadership. And we have training, our, our learning and development team have done an amazing job um, at developing a, a curriculum to support and enable those skills. And when we have conversations about performance, um, we are very much uh, incorporating conversations about health and well being uh, very formally. Hmm. And how would you articulate the values of mindfulness practice to leadership, to health? Um, mm -hmm. You know, how do you articulate those benefits? Yeah, so I think, you know, there's about, uh, what, a million different def definitions, if not more, of mindfulness out there. And at so least. for me, yeah. Yeah. at least, at least. So for me, when I think about mindfulness, I think about it this way. It is really the um, interactions and connectivity across the mind, the body, and the environment as well that then enable um, calmness and clarity. So that's how 
I think about it. Um, you know, I think in this COVID era that we will continue to live in for some time where there's so much uncertainty, there are so many crises, there's so much paradox that we ask any individual human being to be able to process and digest and make sense of every day. A state of calmness and the clarity that results, I think, is incredibly both enabling as well as empowering from a quality of life standpoint and quality of health standpoint, which then clearly translates over to business performance. So when I see leaders um, who are successful and really amazing inspirational leaders, it's almost always the case when you chat with them that they absolutely practice mindfulness very deliberately every single day because you know it, it takes work uh, and it takes work for a very long time. I mean, one day it does become more natural and it doesn't you know, feel like work anymore. It's, it's as natural as, as breathing. Um, but I would say that calmness and clarity that results from mindfulness practice is a huge, huge, huge gift um, at the human level. And then obviously when you roll up a lot of humans together uh, who are driving a business at that level as well. Is it possible to meditate at work in some of Unilever's uh, offices and plants? Yeah, absolutely. We, um, whether it's a manufacturing environment or an office environment, uh, it's very much been the case that uh, we have quiet zones our employees can, um, can retire to. And as we are designing our offices for the future of hybrid working, we are literally formally including in the design process um, you know, the, the physical infrastructure necessary to support the practices of mindfulness. What happened to the the old industrial engineering beliefs around staying at your desk and keeping your nose to the grindstone? This idea oh of a quiet place yeah. for employees to go to take a break. Yeah, no, I, you know, again, in, in the year I've been with Unilever, I have never encountered any of that uh, mindset at all. And again, this is where the, the years of investment and belief systems that are very core and very real um, I think we've probably, uh, if there are individuals who feel that way, let's put it this way, I haven't met them. Yeah. And mm -hmm. how do you think Unilever became the kind of company it is? I mean, I've been aware of Unilever for years, in part because I became aware that it had certified numerous of its companies as B corporations. That's right. A process that's very rigorous, can be very expensive. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you're being judged by... B lab for how socially and environmentally responsible your practices are in public, mm -hmm. which isn't mm -hmm. something a lot of companies go for. And certainly no other consumer products company on the scale of Unilever even approaches its social conscience and its environmental practices. It sounds expensive. I mean, how did, how did a huge company like Unilever become a leader in that way? Well, I think this probably starts um, at the origins uh, of our business. And so I um, was just in the UK a couple of weeks ago and I visited a place near Liverpool called Port Sunlight. So Port Sunlight is where the Unilever business originated in the late 1800s when Lord Lever um, founded a, a company that makes soap. And so I- the uh, dude, There was a dude whose name was Lever? Yes, indeed. I didn't know that. Lever, and eventually he became a lord, as I understand it. Awesome. Um, yes, and so um, when he founded this uh, soap factory in Port Sunlight near Liverpool, um, he built uh, an entire village of many hundreds of homes, which are all standing today. They're, they're actually you can Google it, uh, Port Sunlight. It's it's fascinating, um, but. You know, that concept of a company needing to invest in its workforce, needing to care about the community that it operates under, 
is the the core uh, you know of our DNA as a business. So the very origins of the company were founded on uh, doing good as we were trying to do well as as a business because the the, the two are are fundamentally intertwined. And so that ethos um, has been shared by generation after generation after generation of, of leadership. And our current leadership is absolutely no, no different. As I mentioned earlier, we've cared about um, sustainability long before sustainability became popular and now everybody cares about sustainability. It's, and it's not marketing, it is real. We've staked uh, the very health and future of our business um, on uh, sustainability and then doing good and bringing value back uh, to the communities that we serve. Um, so whether it's you know, in the realm of equity, whether it's the realm of uh, climate, um, and it's not just ourselves that we hold accountable, it's our entire supply chain as well. Um, and whether it's in practices, you know, related to uh, living wage, you know, in all parts of, of the world that we operate in, uh, and, and holding, uh, you know, our partners accountable as well as ourselves for uh, important matters like living wage. These are all things that we believe um, lead to that sustainable future. Uh, for the, the planet that we operate in. And if it's good for uh, communities the world over, uh, good for the health of the planet, if, you know, we, we believe it's good for business as well. So our future is, is uh, uh, you know, placed, a future bets are placed on um, the intertwined do good and do well. Yeah, I'm intrigued by that. So do you, does Unilever adhere to you living wage standards around the world, wherever it operates? Is that part of its... Yeah, so our supply chain team is really hard at work on that initiative. And obviously it's a journey. It's, it's not you know, that there's a magic wand. You, you can wave and all of a sudden it magically happens all over the world. But that is a huge part of our platform and our teams are driving that in, in the communities that we serve and with the partnerships that we have. But just starting out with your own employees, are your are the Unilever's employees worldwide paid living wages? Uh, yes, our employees are uh, paid living wages. And you're saying that you're setting that as a as a goal for your, all of your suppliers as well around the world. Yes, absolutely wow. for employees and suppliers. So if I'm running a soap factory in a small town in Venezuela, and uh, that might not be the right country to use as an example, but let's go with it. And there's a Unilever plant in the same town and Unilever's paying living wages. You also are gonna have that influence then, right? I mean, I'm gonna need to pay something close to living wages in my own soap factory down the road, no matter what my political and economic and social beliefs might be just in order to compete for good employees. That's correct. And we, we believe that um, in so doing, and again, doing the, the right things by our people and the communities that we operate in, we can, again, make sustainable living commonplace. That is the purpose statement of our business. And we know that we alone certainly can't solve the world's ills, but that is a global community, as global businesses, uh, coming together, which means we, we have to push one another um, in, in order to, again, lift the standards of living all around the world. Well, that's extraordinary. And I, I can only imagine the influence that it has, you know, far beyond just Unilever's employee base. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, we have a question about how manufacturing, industrial, logistics employees, people who are working on the line essentially at Unilever. How do, you, how do, we give, how do you give them opportunities to practice mindfulness? Can you give us an yeah, example? So, yeah, absolutely. So um, our whole person health initiatives that have been um, refreshed actually since I, I started, it's been a, a major initiative of our team has actually focused on the manufacturing workforce first versus, you know, it's much easier, of course, to focus on salaried office employees because just practically they're easier to reach. We have email addresses, you know, just a lot easier to reach those that population. But we've chosen to actually focus on the front lines 
of, uh, of our workforce. So these are individuals who are tied, of course, physically to their work. There's no such thing as work from home. Um, these are men and women who've been you know, at work physically in and out uh, every day throughout the pandemic. And so there, um, this is where we need to ensure that we have both digital as well as in-person resources made available to this part of the workforce. And so that um, whether it's during break time and having the ability to again go to our health center that might be inside a factory and have a, a quiet place to sit uh, and breathe and take a moment or whether that person may want to go home to their families and actually practice with them where of course now they're no longer physically at work but to provision then uh, digital tools and to make that available uh, to that entire family unit to practice together. And so it's the marriage of technology and touch, depending on whether the individual is at work or at home and having that continuity. Oh, that's very cool. And in countries where breaks are not mandated, is that still a standard for Unilever that the time is provided in the, in the workday, even for those logistical employees who are on the line? Our employees have time from uh, off from the lines uh, in terms of you know that time to do whatever they need to do. Obviously, uh, there's absolutely no way in the course of a workday that an individual could possibly be on an assembly line or doing whatever work they're doing. They they have to have time uh, to come off and to attend to their basic human needs. It's you know Maslow's hierarchy right there, and so. Um, we ensure that there is at least a place of quiet that uh, human beings can uh, get to, to do whatever they need to do for their, the health of their mind and their bodies. Is there a place where our friends, we have a specific question about this, is there a place where our friends could go to find out more about mindfulness programs at Unilever, particularly in Latin America, this one of our friends who's with us is particularly interested in how you might deploy mindfulness programs in Latin America. Are there websites, other ways that they could connect with Unilever and your way of doing things? I'm happy to speak with anyone who wants uh, further information. We have an intranet, but as, uh, as that implies, it's available to employees of our company. Um, and then we do have a global website, but as you can imagine for a company with our footprint, um, it's hard to get to that depth of detail on a global website, but I'm happy to share you know, any information. How should people reach you? Diana.han at unilever.com. And that's just, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's just her regular old email address. That's how I reach her too. She just gave out her email address. Um, I have one email address. What's that? One email address. Yeah. I'm going to give last call for questions. We, we can go on for a bit longer now, but if you do have a question and you haven't asked it yet and you want to type it into the Q&A section, um, then we, can, we still have time to get a few questions answered. Um, what about for you personally, Diana? What's your mindfulness practice like, and um, how do you how do you make time? And how did you get started? Uh, so I guess starting with the the origin story, although at the time I you know didn't have a, a name for it, but um, so I uh, was born and spent the uh, first few years of my life in in Vietnam, in, in South Vietnam, in Ho Chi Minh City. And at the time, the, the Vietnam War was still raging on. And so my earliest memories in my life are sensory memories. So sounds in particular, whether it's, it's, it's bombings, uh, whether it's artillery fire, smells, so acrid smoke, those are the memories of, of that time of my life. And then my parents, um, took uh, us, you know, my, my brother and me, um, uh, and we left as refugees of war. And we then um, went to a series of successive refugee camps in Subic Bay in the Philippines and Guam, and then ended up at Fort Chaffee in the US, which is how I, I ended up growing up in, in, uh, in the US. Um, again, there, those sensory memories um, continued and, and are what I remember of my earliest childhood. But 
I think because of those particular um, transitions, physical transitions in my life and being a young child at the time, focusing um, on sensations of the body and uh, was sort of the first maybe raw, uh, uncurated experiences of what eventually mindfulness would, would become for, for me, which is just paying attention to, to what all of the, the, the senses I've been given are telling me about what's going on in my body, in my mind, in the environment and the world that I live in, um, were the original origins. And then, you know, from, from there, as I made the decision to go into medicine and then ended up going through a grueling, very long process of, of education, I, I just naturally found that through all the stresses and anxieties uh, of the kind of training that, that medical training involves, quiet places um, and quiet spaces were just naturally how I could keep myself calm and centered and keep my mind clear. And so sometimes actually to achieve a, a quiet place um, from the time I was a teenager, I would just put my, my, my headphones uh, on and listen to music, but there was something about listening to the right kind of music that I enjoyed that actually completely wiped my brain clear and clean and nothing existed, but this incredible palpable enjoyment of that music, but yet the, the brain was not working, thank God. <laughs> it was that have been, brain. that have been like death metal or what kind of music? <laughs> oh my God, I, I don't even remember uh, what those songs in the, you know, in the <laughs> 90s were anymore, but uh, maybe Journey was in there somewhere. <laughs> the funny thing is that, and the joyful part is my, my daughters have rediscovered even 90s music because there's so many covers back then, but it it, it started with that and, and of course, you know, back then that there was in the 90s, it wasn't like the, you know, mindfulness was, was labeled as such per se. Um, but I just noticed that going to a quiet place and, and wiping the mind, but yet still so attuned to the, 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 the physical sensations um, of the body and the senses was something that made me feel better. And coming out of those uh, sessions, I would always feel profoundly refreshed. And then um, from there, it, it became just a, a love and interest of lots of different um, sports. I have a brother, so so growing up, uh, you know, we were always, it was like football, it was, it was softball, it was frisbee, it was everything. Um, and then that became, of course, maybe more organized uh, exercise regimes of, of, every, of every sort, um, from CrossFit to P90X to Shanti, and on and on and on and on. And so there's, there is a, I do lose myself, you know, in, in, in the moment of, of uh, working out and as the endorphins kick in, or sometimes even when I'm running and in particular, I love to run in the fall and the spring when there's a bite in the air, there's different colors that the, the air somehow feels cleaner um, in certain times of the day, depending on when I can leave the house. Sometimes it's cold, sometimes it's warm. Um, and the birds are chirping, so just tuning in to those things. And as, as I'm running and I put one foot in front of the other, again, the mind just becomes wiped clean and clear. And all I am experiencing is the moment of. And, and, and so just, I think when, when you feel so much better in that moment of, and your mind is cleansed and you come back feeling so great, mindfulness becomes profoundly easy and something that you crave and need and just naturally do. And then it became the, by when I was too busy and I was taking call every other day at Mass General during my internal medicine residency, um, then it was all I had time for was breathing. And you know, at that time, every other day call meant you could be on call 36 hours, go home, sleep, and then get up and do it again um, right after that. And if I could just, and sometimes I would have, you know, 20 patients show up who had to be admitted who were incredibly sick because at Mass General, oftentimes we meet patients from all over the world uh, who needed escalated care, or whose, whose care couldn't be accommodated for at a community hospital. There were sick patients. And all it was was just a moment to breathe. 
just in and out and the act of breathing always felt better. And it was just really bite-sized, only took a few seconds. And, and that alone was enough to keep my mind calm and to keep my, uh, my head clear. And so those practices just helped me so much from a quality of life standpoint, a health standpoint, and helped me from a work standpoint. I think I was a better teammate, um, now a better leader of teams because I can stay calm, I can stay clear-headed, I can stay over my own shoulder. And I think mindfulness helps me not get caught up in false urgencies, which uh, unfortunately too, too many business leaders get sucked into because there are a lot of false urgencies in the world. And so, you know, it helps me make sure I've got the right problem statement and I'm focused on all the right things. Thank you for that. What have I not asked you that you kind of wished I had? Oh my goodness. Um, I guess, you know, really how I can help this community. There's, you know, a number of individuals who've given their time and, and commitment to listening to our conversation. And so obviously we are a community. I'm assuming you're here because you have an interest in mindfulness. Uh, that's why I gave out my email address. It's just, uh, how can I be of help and be of service uh, to those who've been generous with their time to join us today? Well, I think one of the things that's on a lot of people's minds, and we can tell from, we've received a lot of questions. Thank you all for participating. And one of the things that's on a lot of people's minds is how can they bring, how can they share, how, how can they share mindfulness through their own jobs, through their own businesses? You know, mm -hmm. what's it like in a small, what are things that we can do in a smaller environment than Unilever's to engage our, our coworkers and our friends? Do you have a... You know, yes. you have some ideas about that? I do, um, and I'm certainly very empathetic that uh, there are a lot of, of small businesses that may not be as, as deeply resourced as a, you know, a giant uh, multinational. But I think at minimum, uh, it's pretty safe to say that uh, the health of the mind and the body is universally relevant, no matter the size of your business. And, and COVID, uh, among you know, the silver linings, has only put a spotlight and, and premium on health and well-being. So I think the first order of business really is um, sensing what your employees are thinking and feeling and needing. And that's sometimes a matter of just asking. It is literally just asking and asking regularly and with sincerity and knowing what's on the minds of your workforce. We, we do that a lot and that's how we know what to focus on. So that's a first order of business and, and any business can do that. And in fact, sometimes the smaller your business, maybe the, the easier it will be to, to not just send out a survey, but to have focus group conversations and to really keep a finger on the pulse. Um, but the other thing I think that's really important is, is raising awareness. So making sure that all of the leaders of teams are having very um, witting conversations with their team members and asking, how are you? Uh, and not just, hey, how are you? And then, you know, let's flip to, to the task at hand. And <laughs> but genuinely, how are you? Um, what's, what's going on and, and checking in, whether it, you know, in person or virtually is really important. And it's, and actually pausing and actually uh, you know, obviously listening with, with sincerity. And I think that will often surface opportunities, especially when you have enough of the, how are, how are you conversations where themes, common themes will emerge. And then from there, I think the, the keeping health and well-being very top of mind in all conversations embedded into the fabric of, of how you support your workforce um, will itself reduce stigma, certainly about issues around emotional well-being and mental health. And so raising awareness, reducing stigma, having regular conversations, sensing what's on the minds of the workforce, understanding what the needs are for your workforce, um, I think are really important. And then from there, there's a ton of resources, including completely free resources that are readily available. Obviously, mindful.org makes a lot of its resources available for all comers. Um, and you know, making those resources available uh, to your workforce, I think those are things all companies uh, can undertake. Well, there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of need. Um, thank you so very much. And thanks to all the folks who joined us this afternoon. Uh, it's been a privilege. And I hope you'll come back again for another 
Leading Mindfully webinar. I actually kind of hope we could have Diana back maybe in a year or so to revisit some of the same things. It's been such a rich conversation with so much valuable information in it. Thanks a million. Thanks for having me. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye.